and I'm still let down. Hype can be a very dangerous thing. When something lives up to the hype, it's incredible. All the time waiting for it to come out becomes worth it. But when something doesn't live up to the hype, it's soul crushing. Like a part of you just died. Video games tend to be the biggest offenders when it comes to overhyped disappointments. Publishers will often oversell the end product and sometimes outright lie to consumers for profit. It's gotten to the point where even gameplay footage can't be trusted anymore. These games, it was very hard to predict how bad they were going to be. They were incredibly hyped up until the release date, and then people could see how the final product wasn't what was promised. To be clear, these games were disappointing to the gaming public at large, and not just to me personally. I'm going to rate these entries based on a scale of hype to disappointment. In other words, how high were people's expectations then versus how badly the game failed short from them? Prepare to see quite a few repeat offenders on this list. They live in my channel rent free now. Those moments when you put everything into a final charge are so epic, which is admittedly really, really fun. It was a good day. TLDR, our writers is destiny, except good. Yeah, I didn't end up liking the finished product. When I first got my hands on the demo for Outriders, it blew me away. Here was a game that managed to take so many things I normally turn my nose up against in gaming into something worth playing. It even made the cover system engaging. Yet, as we all know by this point, it was a different story come launch day. To get the obvious thing out of the way, the technical state managed to surpass Fallout 76 in terms of brokenness. Everything from unstable servers to regular crashes. To say nothing about the inventory wipe, you could have had dozens of hours of progress only for it to be wiped away in seconds. To be fair, this was fixed two weeks later. By the time it happened, thousands of players had already called it quits. The worst part is that Outriders can't even hide behind the live service excuse. This was a game that was meant to be sold as a finished product, not a 10 year journey. I've given Destiny a lot of flack, but at least it was actually playable from the start. I can still remember the exact moment when I knew I was done with Outriders. It was after the third boot from the game for thinking I was cheating. As mentioned earlier, Outriders has been fixed at this point, but unless we get some massive expansion and or patch that makes up for all the earlier frustration, I don't see people coming back for it. In hindsight, it kind of makes sense. Thing was released on April Fool's Day. Ah, uh, Final Fantasy 13. This game is practically the but of the Final Fantasy series. Every joke you can make about this game has been told a hundred times and probably won't go away anytime soon. Even with 14 murdering every other MMO and Final Fantasy VII Remake proving that Square can still make good Final Fantasy games, it's pretty hard to get this blight off of this legendary franchise. For those not in the know, what exactly is wrong with the game? Well, combine extremely linear level design, a confusing and poorly conveyed story, poorly developed and unlikable characters, and a battle system that is summarized as press a button and win, and you can see why people don't like it. Considering 12 had a large world full of political strife in many varied areas, this was a big downgrade. People were angry. And the weird thing is, Square never really lied about how 13 was going to be. Trailers showed how the gameplay and exploration was going to be ahead of time, and there was even a demo for it too. And honestly, there are some misconceptions on some of the issues with 13. Yes, the story is confusing and littered with more nonsense terms than a B-grade fantasy film, but all the characters aren't that bad. Sash and Fang were good, and yet Snow and Lightning are considered bad characters because of how little development they have despite being the lead characters not necessarily them being naturally unlikable. And the gameplay can be more complex if you choose to let it. You still need to outfit your characters and switch paradigms depending on the situation. Just auto battling every time without thinking of paradigms or equipment will get your butt handed to you. And yes, the game is linear, but let's make sure we don't make the mistake that linearity is always bad. The Final Fantasy VII remake is very linear and people don't mind that as much. 
and more points in fairness, this might be one of the more balanced Final Fantasy games. If you recall, most games in this franchise have super broken abilities or exploits that make the games really easy to break. The most 13 has is probably Vanille's death spell, which takes a while to get and a lot of work to make good. Despite these feeble defenses of the game, I'm not saying it's good in any way. It's still really disappointing compared to other console defining heavy hitters like 10, 6, 7 but it's also for those defenses that the game is this low. And unfortunately, unlike 14 and 15, the fixes they tried to do for this game in the sequels made it worse rather than better. Let's hope Final Fantasy VII Remake Part Two doesn't follow the same trend. Allow me to paint the scene. It's 2000, you just finished the final boss of Banjo-Tooie and you read those blessed words. Just wait until Banjo 3E. And you're excited. You're thinking, yay, more funny bear and bird games. But the years pass and there's still no sign of return for our beloved duo. But then in 2006, a heavenly sign emerges. Finally, a new Banjo-Kazooie title, one that promises to bring their hilarious hijinks to a whole new generation on the Xbox. We waited with bated breath and two years later, we're just left wondering what the f they gave us. And thus, Nuts and Bolts was born, aka the breeding ground for some of JonTron's best memes. I mentioned in the past how the first level, Nutty Acres, is really the highlight of the game, and I still stand by that, because for a brief, shining moment, it felt like a Banjo-Kazooie game. And I'm not gonna lie, if they polished up a few bugs or have something to work with, it could have been a decent game, except for the biggest reason for our disappointment. We've been duped! Duped! Bamboozled! We've been speckled off! That's not even a word and I agree with you! Yeah, that's the biggest sin about Nuts and Bolts. We were deceived. The teaser gave us a feeling of a return to form, but the final product is basically saying, ha, you wanted a Banjo-Kazooie game? LOL, JK Boomer. It goes out of its way to dump on its legacy as though it's ashamed of what its predecessors were. Look, I get it, platformers and collectathons aren't everyone's cup of tea, and I get what Microsoft wanted to try to do, reintroduce the series to a new generation and stay alive in the market. But there's a point where self-deprecating becomes less humorous and more disrespectful, especially for the supporters, not only to the fans, but also to the people who worked on the thing. And pretty sure they passed that point long ago. At the time of this video, there are currently no plans for a new Banjo-Kazooie game, which means that Nuts and Bolts is for the moment, the last chapter in the franchise's story. Boy, did that go out on a whimper. However, with their miraculous return in Smash Ultimate, let's not rule anything out just yet. All we can do is hope that one day, someone who truly cares about the duo will give them the proper sequel they deserve. Or even better, a remastering of the original games might be welcomed. We already know how much companies love to cash in on nostalgia. Ugh, this game, this freaking game. Don't pretend you didn't see this one coming. You've ranted about it, the Game Grumps lived through it. I did a Sound of Silence spoof and a whole freaking Pirates of Penzance about it. Mixed graphics, super plot, and just the lack of sanity. It is the very model of a modern game calamity. So really, I don't know what I can say that I haven't already said. But if for whatever reason, you've never heard of this game. First, let me say, I envy you to be that young and blissfully ignorant again. Sonic 06 is a game designed for the Blue Hedgehog's 15th anniversary. It was supposed to be a soft reboot to give him a more realistic... <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't do it. What part of this is supposed to be realistic? If there was any realism, at least would be in jail for possible bestiality and nothing of value would be lost. But as people are quick to point out, that's the least of this game's issues, which there's also the glitchy graphics, bonkers story, broken gameplay, head-scratching continuity errors, the overall sense that they just didn't bother testing the game before rushing it for release, and Silver... It's for me. There's nowhere to go but up for him, folks. Trust me. That being said, I'm not ashamed to admit that the Blaze the Cat Wave Ocean and Crisis City levels are the best levels in the game because they feel like a breath of fresh air amongst the unfinished insanity. But really, the majority of you know that by now, so is there really nothing to be said that hasn't already been said about this mess? 
one. Actually, something I don't think I mentioned before, but there have been attempts by fans doing their own remake of this infamous title. As of this video, there have only been three demos released and progress has slowed down quite a bit. Hopefully with these remakes, the developers can do what Sega failed to do, not rush productions. Cause I won't lie, the idea of a more realistic or grittier or darker Sonic story could work with a talented team behind it. If only they had that talented team with them the first time. Wait, a new game by one of the guys behind Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, and Quake? <laughs> well this, this is gonna be amazing, I gotta play it! Well, that sucked. Oh boy, Daikatana! The 2000 FPS developed by now infamous game designer John Romero. Well, he wasn't infamous at the time. Being the co-developer behind legendary FPS's Doom, Quake, and Wolfenstein, this game had an insane amount of hype behind it. With inspiration from Japanese culture and a nod to Miyamoto, and of course John Romero himself being in charge, this game was slated to be the next Quake. But, well, you know what video you're watching. First off, the game was in development hell for three years. They switched the engine for the game partway through development. And unlike when Nomura did it for KH3, Romero didn't have a following that was patient with delayed releases. Seriously, we were weirdly patient with that. <laughs> Plus, part of his team left a good chunk into the game's development to work on another game, Deus Ex. A game that debatably did reach the same status of Quake and Doom, but that's another story. Those factors led to Romero releasing the game in a poor state. It got slammed by critics for outdated graphics and gameplay. Its poor AI was also an issue due to the high focus on your AI controlled partners in the gameplay, and anyone who played an escort mission that wasn't Bioshock Infinite knows how bad poor AI can be. Yeah, these guys were supposed to help you. As you can expect, the game sold pretty poorly, only around 40,000 copies. Great for a lesser known JRPG, bad for a AAA shooter. It's funny since the marketing went around telling you John Romero's about to make you his bitch. Well, he kinda did if you bought the game. And the biggest kick in the teeth here, the poor sales caused the Game Boy Color version of the game to not be released in the States. And the Game Boy Color version was considered to be the better version due to its focus on adventure and it being developed by a different team. Romero has gone through a bunch of downs since Daikatana, including having a failed Kickstarter campaign only four days after it started. But Daikatana is where it all began. The fan base for the game still lives though, giving it an unofficial patch in 2016 that fixed a good number of issues. But considering where it started, it's only fitting that it stayed dead. Cause really, it should have been called Died Katana, am I right? Cause it was a lie Katana that makes you ask why Katana. No. Come on in. Oh, don't give me that. You know you have to. Yeah, just rip the bandaid off. Let's go. <sighs> Saw that one coming. Oh, uh, look, another surprise for the list. The long awaited proper continuation to the original Duke Nukem franchise that circled the pits of development hell for over a decade, and when it finally came out, it was not worth the wait. I've talked about how the first level was the best part, mostly because of the blessed whiteboard. I've talked before how it suffers poorly in terms of graphics, gameplay, and humor. I've talked about it so much that it's become a household name for my channel next to the Kingdom Hearts series. So instead of beating this dead horse with another Deader horse? How about something different? Top 10 jokes to make about Duke Nukem Forever! The game starts out in a bathroom. Coincidence or foreshadowing? The answer? Yes! Duke Nukem Forever? More like Duke Nukem For Never would be a more appropriate title. Heh, <laughs> got him. It's a product of its time, in the worst possible sense. Actual footage of George Bessard commenting when the game will be done. When I feel like it. Devs were playing hot potato with the game and everyone lost, especially us. You sure Spike TV didn't work on the game? Or at least some half-baked rip-off of Suda51? As in all the lewdness without the creative insanity? I wish to register a complaint about this Duke Nukem sequel I purchased not a half hour ago from this very boutique. Ah uh, yes, the Norwegian Forever, what's wrong with it? I'll tell you what's wrong with it. It's crappy and that's what's wrong with it. They say patience is a virtue. I don't know if that applies here since they wasted everyone's time. You don't want this to become No More Heroes Forever, do you? 
Hey, give it credit for this. We got it before Yandere Simulator. Oh, come on. If we got the freaking Snyder Cut before Yandere Simulator, I don't think I'm allowed to pull my punches anymore. Mighty number nine, the staple of broken promise in modern gaming. You might be wondering, how did it come to this? Inafune promised a spiritual successor to Mega Man. It had tons of promotional art, Kickstarter goals, and was even promised sequels and a TV series. Well, how about that the production for the game got way too ambitious way too quickly? The game was trying to find its way to be ported to various different consoles, so there's a lot of crunch surrounding the quality control for each version. Oh, and remember that other project, Red Ash? Yeah, that canned successor from Mega Man Legends kickstarted using funds from the previous game's budget. Say what you will about Kamiya, but he ain't wrong here. So thanks to the complete lack of a cohesive production schedule, the game faced numerous delays coupled with an advert that clearly doesn't know what it's trying to get across. Do you like awesome things that are awesome? Then you gotta play this game, dude. It's freaking cool. Radical, dude! What came out is a cardboard cutout of what was promised with poor graphics, clunky performance, and mechanics that break both the game and the player's lack of sanity. I suppose given the exhaustion people got from the delays and troubled production, they're already expecting a bomb. So I guess, in a cosmic sort of way, it didn't disappoint. But there's a silver lining to all this. The Gunvolt series did salvage the characters and utilize them for an actual good game. At least that's one way to give a good, less popular series some traffic. Remember when people said No Man's Sky was going to be Spore done right? For all the crap that people throw at Spore, give it some credit. At least it still kept some of the interesting mechanics promised. This? <laughs> There's a good reason space-loving Markiplier stopped LPing this one. No Man's Sky is one of those games that promises way too much. It has nowhere near enough time to put out all the content. You have heard this song and dance before. Big open space exploration with unique habitats, ecologies, and a gripping mystery surrounding the universe. What we got instead is Bethesda Land in space. Sure, the game was fun at first, but... It didn't take long before you'd start to notice the empty planets, ugly habitats, bugs ahoy, and just a general lack of anything to do. You know, other than the repeated routine of getting resources to move to another planet, rinse and repeat. It feels less like a complete package and more like a template for a space simulator. Heck, it's more like a refund simulator at that point. <laughs> Let's address the elephant in the room. Yes, Sean Murray wasn't fully in control of the hype surrounding the game. Being picked up by a producer and given a AAA treatment can certainly put a lot of pressure on what should have been an indie production. He's a developer, not a presenter. The opposite of Inafune. Clearly, he wasn't prepared to deal with the hype train that producers and journalists put him through. Granted, lies are still lies, so there's no stopping people from labeling them as such. But it's important to keep in mind what goes on with a game's production and how sometimes hasty deadlines come with the contract. No Man's Sky isn't a similar case as Mighty Number no. 9, where most of the faults are from the creator's decisions. It came down to reliance on publicity by a major publisher and the consequences you have to deal with. The good news out of all this is that Sean didn't give up. As a tried and true team of developers, they patched the game time and time again reforging it into the good No Man's Sky we know today. The game is actually appealing now and even more features than initially promised and a stable experience without game breaking bugs. It's nice to see Hello Games got its footing back the right way, proving to the world that they are passionate developers who deserve a chance at redemption. What matters now is whether or not we learn from history and prepare ourselves to understand the hardships that come with productions such as this one. I don't think Star Citizen could give us as good as a story, though. Some fan bases are repeatedly bamboozled by shockingly bad products, used to being disappointed. True, many franchises have a dud or two, but there are some sad few that have had installment after installment of mediocrity, or worse. From 1992 all the way to 2014, the Alien fans found themselves in this sorry situation. Yep, we can't talk about disappointing games without Gearbox's magnum opus of crap, 
Aliens Colonial Marines. I remember a time when the marketing for this game was in full swing and people were hyped. The Aliens franchise hadn't seen their own console game, or at least one that didn't have those pesky predators stealing the spotlight, since 2000's Alien Resurrection. Everything else had either been subpar handheld games or worse, mobile games. The horror! <laughs> So when Gearbox, the guys behind the much beloved Borderlands, announced they were making a console game for the franchise, the internet went nuts! Trailers started coming out and the game looked amazing! The marketing made the game seem flawless! And then it came out. And then the controversy came out. And then the lawsuit. Yes, overhyping something can kill it, but fans were expecting, at the very least, a clean, polished, enjoyable, playable game. They instead got this barely functioning, ugly, and painful mess. These days with titles such as Watch Dogs under our belt, we know how misleading gameplay trailers can be. But the audience of the late 2000s, early 2010s were a yet innocent crowd, unaware of the horrors that awaited them. After this, Gearbox would slowly but surely garner a reputation for shady business practices and even shadier personal conduct. For those excited for Colonial Marines, Gearbox were still the heroes behind Borderlands who could do no wrong, thus cementing Alien's Colonial Marines spot at number two. It probably doesn't help that apparently most of the AI's jank can be fixed by changing a single line of code. Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. Star Wars Battlefront 2, the original LucasArts pandemic title was just fine, but then in comes sneaky old Mr. EA with their microtransactions. Anthem, the combat and visuals are top notch, but the grind and story and loading times really drag it down. Watch Dogs, the game looked amazing at E3 2012, and then it came out, and it sucked. Dynasty Warriors 9, give them credit, they tried something new with the open world experience. Don't try it again, please. Shenmue 3, the Kickstarter crashed. So did the fans' hopes and dreams. The Walking Dead, The New Frontier. Clementine takes a back seat for a less interesting ensemble, and we see just how much your choices don't matter. Seriously, what was the point of that? Too Human, amazing promises of epic proportions, and gave us a practically unfinished clunky mess. Audio's really nice, though. <laughs> Metroid Other M. Uh, let's give you some context. Nintendo fans were starved for good games, especially after the disastrous E3 2008. So the light, the bright, shining hope at the end of E3 2009 depicted an action-packed, side-scrolling, 3D-moving, and FPS hybrid with much more story, dialogue, while also explaining the thread in Metroid Fusion about Samus' backstory and her history with the Federation. What could possibly go wrong? In terms of the story, what didn't go wrong? In terms of the gameplay... Well... To try and be objective, the gameplay of Other M is decent, for the most part. But no denying, one of the most infamous changes was the authorization mechanic. For context, the Metroid series generally has Samus lose her abilities somehow in each installment. Sometimes it's justified, sometimes it isn't. Other M tried to have it make sense through the authorization mechanic. To sum it up, you now have to let Adam authorize the use of upgrades instead of obtaining them yourself. Now, at this point, you may be thinking, wow, that sounds like a really bad idea for a game mechanic. And to that, I say... PRECISELY! You'd think that after proving herself as a competent bounty hunter to the Federation throughout the Metroid timeline, yeah, this is later in the timeline, Samus could be trusted with all the Federation's equipment, right? Well, not according to Adam, who treats her like a shop student learning how to use power tools. Speaking of Adam, that brings us nicely to the real problem with Other M. The story. Further proof that there are no bad ideas, only bad executions, Other M's story works perfectly fine as a concept. A mid-quill focusing on Samus' relationship with her commanding officer. This was the game that was supposed to redefine Samus as a fully realized three-dimensional character. And again, it all comes down to execution. And said execution was appallingly bad, what with the utter mutilation of Samus and Adam's characters. Samus went from an empowering, galaxy-saving bounty hunter to submissive waifu bait. 
Adam went from a strict but fair commander to one of the most unintentionally hateable characters in gaming. Honestly, you could have had the whole any objections lady thing work by making it an inside joke between Adam and Samus. Yeah, you may think that'll seem out of place in something as serious as the military, but having that sort of thing be an inside joke would be very appropriate. And then we get to the symbolism. Other M is one of the most unsubtle works of fiction ever created. Its use of symbolism is so obvious and in your face that it borders on parody. It feels like an episode of terrible writing advice come to life. Time spent researching and understanding is time better spent thinking about how future generations of literary elites will be praising the depth and complexity of my deep symbols that took a whole Google search to find. Honestly, you could use this to teach a writing class on mistakes to avoid. What is the symbolism, you ask? Well, let me spell it out for you more than the game does. <clears throat> the bottle ship. Other M is an anagram for mother. Metroid Other M is an acronym for mom. To say nothing of the incessant use of... Baby. 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 Because heaven forbid we let people come to their own conclusions, am I right? As a result of all this, Other M bombed. Hard. It did so poorly that it temporarily killed off the whole franchise. It took six years before another Metroid game came out and seven years before one that people actually wanted. While things are looking up with dread on the horizon, there was a time when being a fan of the franchise was downright despair inducing. God Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for Tabletop, and Pop Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching.